Good evening. So keeping with the wonderful room we have, I'm going to be very relaxed tonight. I'm going to talk to you about um, the SKA, but more importantly about why we're excited, why I'm excited, why the world's excited about SKA. It's um, the culmination, if you like, or the next step in a journey of discovery. It's a journey of discovery of astronomy over the last 400 years, maybe even the last 10 or 20,000 years. But it's a it's a time in the history of the evolution of science, and particularly the evolution of astronomy, in which we are really truly on the brink of something totally new and totally different. And it's even more exciting because there's a chance that this breakthrough, this step into the future, is going to happen here in Australia. So tonight I want to talk to you about astronomy, mostly, about where astronomy's come from, where it's going to, and the role that Australia can play in the future of that subject. So, Telescopes are machines that we use to look at the universe. When we look at the universe, we almost always want to choose the best place to stand to look at the universe. And this is the Hubble Space Telescope, crowning achievement, if you like, of the optical astronomy, the sort of light you see with your eyes. I was lucky enough to work on this project for five years, and it's produced some of the most amazing pictures of the universe we've ever seen. Why is it producing those amazing pictures? Because it's in a very special place. It's up above the atmosphere of the Earth. The atmosphere of the Earth is, for a better or worse, a dirty window. It's, when you look through it, it's a distorted view of the outside universe. And so because a Hubble is up there above the Earth's atmosphere, it has this incredibly clear and wonderful view of the universe. And so special machines, special tools, special places. And I'll come back to that theme uh, during the talk. Telescopes are pretty simple things, they're just like eyes. So we all have eyes, most of us in the room have two of them, um, and they have a little hole in the middle of the eye called the pupil. And through that pupil, all the information about the outside world streams, okay? And that pupil, it's not very big, it's only about five millimetres, a little tiny hole to let that light in to the outside world. So how could you possibly improve on that? How could you make your ability to look at the universe around you better? Well, the obvious answer is to make the eye bigger, okay? So, there's some limitations, of course. Our heads are only so, so big, but if I made my eyeball five times bigger, 25 millimetres across, there'd be a lot more light going into my optic nerve and a lot more information about the world flooding in from the outside, more sensitivity, if you like. So how much better would that be? Well, here's your piece of mathematics for the evening. There's not going to be much more. This is about it. And if you can take 25 and divide it by 5, which is answer is 5, and square that, you get how, many, how much better the big eyeball is. And the little eyeball is, it goes like the area, it goes like the diameter squared. So that big eye is about 25 times more sensitive than the little one to seeing the outside world. So that's how we would improve our visibility in the universe. But again, it's a practical problem. You don't want to grow your eyeball that big. It would be very hard to carry it around. This gentleman discovered how to, in fact, do exactly that. So 400 years ago, 2009, in fact, was the 400th anniversary of Galileo's use of the telescope. So the telescope is the trick. The telescope is the way of making your eyeball effectively bigger. So Galileo had a little telescope, a little red one that's in the picture here. It had a lens. The lens is about 25 millimetres across. So all the light that fell under that 25 millimetres of lens was focused, bent, down to fit through the 5 millimetres of my pupil. So that's the trick. You use lenses, you use optics to gather large amounts of light, large amounts of information, and push them down into that very small opening that we had. So Galileo was the first person to use the telescope to look at the universe. And that's one of his books there, you can see. And in the book, he drew the pictures of the stars that he could see in the sky. And there are stars there, which are basically the nice little pointy ones that like you draw when you're a kid. And there are little black dots as well. All those little black dots there, the non-pointy ones, Nobody had ever seen those stars before. It was not possible with your human eye to see them. And so this is an amazing discovery. It expanded the universe, if you like. There were thousands and thousands of times more stars visible to Galileo with his telescope, simply because it's a bigger eyeball. Okay, that's the trick, make the eyeball bigger. So he was able to discover stars and expand the universe just by pointing the telescope at the sky. He did some other things as well. He pointed the telescope at the moon. And these are pictures they're from his notebooks of the moon. And on the moon he saw some pretty amazing things. He saw things that looked like mountains and valleys and canyons and all the sorts of things that you see on the earth, in various places on the earth. So all of a sudden he thought, well, hang on a second, maybe the moon is very much like the earth. Maybe it's made of rocks and not you know, green cheese or painted on some screen out there. It's actually very similar to the earth. And that's one of those amazing sort of aha 
kind of moments in science when you think, here's something that looks like something else. Maybe they're actually the same sort of thing. So the telescope was an incredible tool for generating these kind of aha moments in science and showing people new insights into the universe. In particular, started with Galileo. This is one of my favorite pictures. This is a picture of the coast of Chile. So that land you can see there is the coast of Chile in South America on the west coast. Um, and that's the Hubble Space Telescope and just being pushed out of the cargo bay of the shuttle. And we're looking down on that Pacific Ocean. So the Pacific Ocean is to the lower part of the picture. And then there's the land. And then there's the Andes Mountains. And on the top left-hand side, you've got the clouds that form from the, other, on from the eastern side of the Andes. <coughs> this is amazing because there's a very big cold current of water there, the Humboldt Current. The Humboldt Current on the Pacific Ocean means all the clouds condense over the ocean. And because you've got the high mountains there, the Andes, it blocks all the moisture coming from the Amazon basin. And so you have this strip of land in the northern part of Chile, which is essentially clear 365 nights of the year. One of the most fantastic places in the world to do astronomy. A very special place, just like orbit is a very special place. And so some of the very biggest telescopes in the world have gone off to Chile. So I was lucky enough to work for the last 12 years in Munich for a European Southern Observatory for an organization that built the world's largest optical telescope. So here it is. It's called the Very Large Telescope. Right? Not terribly imaginative, but it's called the Very Large Telescope. So the VLT for short to its friends. It's four incredibly large telescopes. So remember I said Galileo had 25 millimeters of lens. Each one of the mirrors inside these guys is 8.2 meters across. Okay? So that's about 25 million euros worth of optics, 450 tons of mechanics, about a billion euros worth of facility. This is big science. This is globally important science. Built by this organization called ESO in Munich, 13 countries working together to build this facility. I was lucky enough to help design and build this facility. So one of my colleagues standing underneath these 8.2 meter telescopes, you can see how big they are. They're incredibly precise and accurate machines for looking at the universe, but they're looking at the universe in the same kind of light we see with our eyes, in the optical part of the spectrum. They gather optical light, they focus it, they put it into special cameras, and those cameras produce data for computers and science gets done. Special machines, very, very, very special place. This northern part of Chile is also special for radio astronomy as well. You can see on the map there, just a little bit further inland than from where the VLT is, we're building a new radio telescope. So radio telescope, it's dishes, they receive radio waves. Focus radio waves, produce images, just like optical telescopes. This is a place called Chatnator. It's at 5,200 meters up in the upper Andes in the Altiplano, in the upper Andes. And it's billiard table flat for 10, 20 kilometers, but it's at 5,200 meters. So you need breathing apparatus to go work there, or at least I do. Um, and sprinkled around the horizon there, those little hills are in fact active volcanoes. Okay, so this is an incredibly special. One of the things about being an astronomer is you get to see some pretty impressive places. This is one of the most impressive places I've ever seen in the world. But it happens to be one of the world's best places to do radio, radio astronomy. These telescopes here are collecting extremely high frequency radio waves. Radio waves that would be in fact blocked by clouds. So again, you know, having no clouds and no water vapor is a very important thing for these radio dishes. And so again, Chile turns out to be an extremely important and unique place in the world. So we build big telescopes and we put them in very special places. And we build different kinds of telescopes. You've seen two kinds of telescopes already, the optical telescope and the radio telescope. Why are we wasting all our money building different kinds of telescopes? Why do you need different kinds of telescopes? This is near to my home in Munich, just in the Bavarian countryside, a nice sort of summer's afternoon. This is a kind of picture you'd take with a normal digital camera. It's, there's grass and trees and cows and mountains and various other things. That's an optical picture like you see with your eyes. What would this picture look like if I had different kinds of eyes? If I had, for example, eyes that were sensitive to infrared light. So this is the infrared picture. Okay? It looks different. You see clouds. You didn't see any clouds before. You see the grass is different, the trees are different, the rocks, the mountains, everything's different. It's different because infrared light bounces off rocks and cows and trees differently than optical light does. Infrared light takes a different path, if you like, through the system. And so by comparing optical and infrared pictures, I get more information about the cows, the grass, and the trees. So different wavelengths bring different information to me. Here's the beautiful Milky Way. 
So we're extremely lucky in Australia. If you go out in the garden and fall over on your back and look up in the sky, we're looking dire directly in to the middle of our own home Milky Way galaxy. Our galaxy is a big Catherine wheel spiral of 100,000 million stars all buzzing around a centre. And we live on that disk of those stars. And so when we look back, we see the stripe, the disk of the plane of the galaxy and back into the middle of the galaxy. The middle of the galaxy is right in the middle of this picture. Now, I have to digress a little bit and tell you a story here. So when I came back to Australia after being away for about 27 years or so, a lot of my friends back here said, oh, isn't it fantastic you're back in the Southern Hemisphere and be able to see all these wonderful stars and constellations that we see in the Southern Hemisphere. We see the, you know, the milk, you see the uh, Southern Cross and, uh, and the, the Big Emu. And I said, hang on a second, Big Emu, what's, never heard of the Big Emu. Big Emu is new to me. And I said, oh yeah, the Big Emu, you must have heard of the Big Emu. It's one of the famous constellations in the Southern sky. No, I think they were pulling my leg. Well, in fact, there is a Big Emu, okay? And this is where multi-wavelength astronomy is interesting. The Aboriginal people, 20,000, 30,000, 40,000 years ago, in the desert in Australia, had this beautiful scenery to look at here, and they could see the black patches, all that black stuff in the plane of the Milky Way is dust and gas in our galaxy. Our galaxy is full of all sorts of dust and material that stars make during their lives, and eventually what stars are made from when they, uh, when they come together to be born. So there's dust and gas in the Milky Way as well as stars which are shining. So the Aboriginal people actually were very clever. They made constellations from the shape of the black stuff as well as the shape of stars. The Greeks and the Romans and the Mayans and the Chinese connected up the stars, all the bright things, but the Aboriginal people connected up the black things. So big emu. Right. There's the big emu. It's a really truly huge emu, okay? So it's most of the sky is the emu, but lo and behold, there he is. So you can see him. It's very obvious when you know where to look. So the Aboriginal people made this picture of the sky which had black stuff and not bright stuff. A very different way of looking at the sky. So I learned some astronomy after 27 years of being away, coming back to Australia. Here's the picture of the Milky Way in the infrared. Okay? It looks different. There's no more emu. Okay? The infrared light is extremely good at going through dust. Infrared light penetrates the dust. And so, in fact, if you want to look at the middle of our galaxy, Normally, before it, the emu blocked it, all the dust and stuff in the emu blocked our vision of the center of the galaxy. Lo and behold, if you look in the infrared, the infrared light goes straight through the emu, and there you are. You're looking straight into the heart of our own Milky Way galaxy. So infrared telescopes complement, add information to optical telescopes. Here's the picture in the radio. Looks different. Big plumes, all sorts of interesting things going on. Radio waves come from gas, from cold gas and coal gas is in different places than the stars, it's in different places than the dust. And so by putting all these kind of eyeballs, different kinds of eyeballs together, we get this incredibly interesting picture of the galaxy. So that's why we build different kinds of telescopes, to give us this complete physical picture of the universe we live in. You won't get the whole story if you just stick to one wavelength. So we have all these big telescopes, they're different kinds of telescopes. And we've spent the last 400 years trying to figure out what's out there. Okay? So it's a pretty hard problem, actually. It's really one of the fun things about being an astronomer is you have to be reasonably clever. I don't mean that in a facetious way. You just have to be, all you have is a point of light out there in the sky. You don't have a laboratory, you don't have test tubes, you don't have an atom smasher. All you have is a point of light. And from that one point of light, you have to figure out how big things are, how far away they are, how many of their things are, and how old they are. All these are incredibly important questions for astronomy, and all you have is a point of light. Can't touch it, can't go to it, can't look behind it. You've got to figure it all out from that point of light. So astronomy tends to be a science where people get devious and clever and try very hard to figure these answers out. So I'm going to talk to you about some of the devious things we do. One of the questions, of course, everybody wants to know, you know, what, 400 years you've been looking, is there anything out there? Is anybody else out there? So I'll try to answer that in steps. Okay. So the first thing to say is, well, we see what we think are the places where other planets are. So these are pictures of stars on the right-hand side, and around stars we can see gas and dust, which looks like that animation. The animation on the left is what happens to one of these disks of dust and gas as it evolves. It forms little blobs, little planetoids are actually formed. This is a fairly natural process as stars that we know about in the sky have disks around them, and those disks appear to be the birthplaces of planets. So the material, the nurseries for planets exist. 
But how do you actually find a planet? Because you know, a planet is a very hard thing to find. It doesn't glow. A planet is made of rocks or gas. They don't give out their own light. The only reason you see Jupiter and Saturn and Mars shining in the sky is because the sun's shining on them and the light's coming back to you. If the sun got turned off, they'd go black. So finding planets is very, very hard because they don't shine. So they're black stuff. So how are we going to find a planet? How are you going to see a planet? Well, here's where you start to become clever. Okay, so here's a star with a planet going around it. And you'll notice two interesting things that are going on. First thing, of course, is that the planet occasionally goes in front of the star and blocks a bit of the light of the star. So if all you could see was the light from the star, the star light would be along, and then all of a sudden it'd go blip blip down and back up again. Right? So if you see stars that sort of lose a bit of light and then it comes back and then lose a bit of light and comes back, chances are that's a planet buzzing around the star. The other thing you notice is that the star wobbles, okay, because the, the planet and the star are going around the common center of the orbit. And so if you couldn't see the planet, you can see the star, the star would actually wobble in the sky. And so both of these things have been seen. This is real data on the left-hand side there is one of the light curves which has gone down and come back up again and of, a st of, a plan of a star. And by measuring the duration of that blip and the depth of that blip, you know how big the planet is and how fast it is moving past the star. <laughs> the thing on the right-hand side is the wandering of a particular star, a wobbling of a star like a drunken person as it goes across the sky. And that's the wobble introduced by a planet being there. So we've got these indirect, sort of clever, Sherlock Holmesy kind of ways of figuring out that there are planets of black things out there in the universe. So we've found lots and lots and lots. Occasionally you get lucky. So here's a, a really direct picture. There's a big star and that little red fuzzy thing next to it, in fact, is a big, a really, really, really big planet. So this is, this is easy because this planet was really, really big, but we can now get with some of these big telescopes to the point where you can actually see some of the planets around the stars. So we've got found lots and lots of planets. So this is a, a plot which shows how far the planet is from the star versus the name of the star. And you can see all these various kinds of planets. They're all pretty big. They're all measured in M with little j. That means mass of Jupiter. So these guys are all huge. They're all comparable to the mass of Jupiter, which is a very, very, very big planet, about a 1,000 times more massive than the planet Earth. So it's easy to find big ones. That's why we found all the big ones first, right? I mean, finding little ones is harder because the wobbles are smaller and the occultations are smaller. Okay, so looking for planets, we've found lots and lots of planets out there. So the places where life could exist are becoming quite numerous. And so that's one of the big discoveries, if you like, of astronomy. One of the other discoveries of astronomy is that stars are very dynamic. They don't, stars aren't fixed. When the universe was created and when the galaxy was created, stars weren't locked into a pattern. They actually evolve during their life. They actually get born, they go through life, and they eventually die. So here's some very young pl places where young stars are formed. So on the left-hand side is like in the middle of the emu. All that black stuff is dark dust, and there's a star which is actually collapsing out of that dust, and eventually the star turns on, begins to shine, blows away all that umbilical material, and you get left on the right-hand side with these bright, shiny new stars just emerging from their cocoons, if you like, as they were born. Stars go through midlife crises, just like people. Um, here are some stars. This isn't, this isn't modern art. This is actually real, live Hubble pictures of stars. When a star gets to a certain point in its lifetime and it starts to get a bit excessive uh, middle section, it wants to blow it off, wants to get rid of that excess weight. And so sometimes stars will shed themselves of their outside atmospheres and they puff it off like a smoke ring. So these are stars in the process of actually puffing off their outsides, their, their exterior, to basically lose mass and become more stable. And so they go to the amazingly beautiful patterns of puffing off of material and produce, as I said, pretty much what looks like modern art. Stars can also die, and stars can die some very violent deaths, and occasionally they explode, produce enormous amounts of debris. This is the debris, the explosion, left after a star that exploded about a thousand years ago. Here's an example of one which is fairly recent. So this is the Magellanic Clouds, this nearby galaxy to us. 1987, the picture on the left, one day. One day later, that very, very bright star appeared. That was a supernova, this explosion of a star in a very nearby galaxy to us. So these things occur about once every century inside the Milky Way itself. Very incredible processes, a whole star exploding. And when the star explodes and then there's some remnants left behind, we can study the remnant in multiple wavelengths. So here is a radio picture of the debris an infrared picture of the debris, and finally the optical picture of the debris. And by putting all that information together, we can discover the physics, how that explosion actually occurred. Even x-rays get emitted by some of these things. If I look down in the very core of this 
remnant of an explosion. I can see there's a very powerful source of very high energy particles, X-rays, which are coming out of there. And I can actually make a little movie. Hubble's done that. And you can see in the middle, in the remnants of this explosion, something remarkable is happening right down in the core here. Something is actually alive and ticking in the remnants of this big explosion. Something producing enormous amounts of energy. And of course, this is the mysterious and the wonderful black hole. So the black hole is the kind of remnant that you can form after stars explode. This is an artist impression. Why is it glowing? Well, it's glowing because black holes have got an incredibly strong gravity field. So strong, they can shred, shred the stars which come nearby to them. So all this shredded material of stars is all that disk and that sort of stuff. And that disk of material gets blown out in these very strong jets of energy. And those jets really exist. This is a picture on the bottom left here of a real galaxy. It's a black hole in the middle of this galaxy and this great jet of energy squirting out of the middle of the galaxy. That comes from a black hole in that galaxy with a mass of about a billion times the mass of our sun. A whole galaxy's worth of black holes all in one place. So these black holes we can see indirect, if you like, evidence for the black holes existing. It would be nice to kind of figure out some more direct evidence for them existing. Remember, astronomers like to be clever. They like to see things that don't shine, and so black holes don't shine directly. So we need to build machines and tools and techniques to find black holes. So going back again to the VLT, the VLT has some little children, if you like, these little R2-D2 kind of guys here. They are little telescopes. There are actually four of them, and they move. They run around on the top of the mountain. And the light from the sky goes into these little guys, and it's combined together to make a very, very, very high resolution picture. If you can combine light from telescopes that are spread apart, um, you can form a very high resolution picture. So these guys have been working, looking at the center of the Milky Way galaxy to see if there's any evidence for a black hole, because most of the galaxies appear to have these black holes in the middle. So they started to make some movies of the center of the middle of the Milky Way galaxy, in the middle of the EMU, right? And lo and behold, there appears to be something flashing on and off in the middle of the Milky Way galaxy. You can see it flashing on and off in the middle. Something glowing, something amazingly active, maybe like the little movie we saw, something active is happening in the middle of the galaxy. So they thought, this is really great. So let's, let's try and track maybe the motions of the stars themselves and see if there's anything interesting going on. So this is actually a movie. You can see time in years ticking away up there of the orbits of stars. This is, a real, this is real stars, real movie. Um, and these stars are moving in the middle of the galaxy, buzzing around, buzzing around, buzzing around. I want you to watch one particular star, this particular star coming in from the top. Okay, so it goes around and around. So it's in a nice little orbit, you know, like the planets going around the sun, the stars are in orbits. The interesting thing is, what was it going in orbit about? Okay, there's nothing there. There's nothing at the center of the orbit of that star. So, using rules we knew from Mr. Newton and Mr. Einstein, um, we can calculate the mechanics of that orbit and we can figure out the mass of the thing sitting in the middle. It turns out that our galaxy indeed has a black hole of about three million times the mass of the sun. And that black hole is sitting at the center of the orbit of that particular star. Okay? So again, here's another great way of looking for things which don't shine and telling us, using physics and mathematics to tell us about dark stuff. One of the people who was incredibly influential in the journey of discovery, remember Galileo started this journey of discovery 400 years ago, is Erwin Hubble. So this is Mr. Hubble, and he did his work in America in the early 1900s and 1920s, particularly during the First World War when there was blackout conditions in Los Angeles, and so the city was black. And so Mount Wilson Observatory behind LA was a nice place to do astronomy. Not anymore, but it was then. Um, and so he used the telescope there, and he made two amazing discoveries in his career, all about the same time. Number one discovery was he discovered the universe is big. Okay, it might sound silly, but it, up until Hubble's time, we were talking about the 1910, 1920, people thought the entire universe was the Milky Way galaxy. They had no idea that beyond the confines of the Milky Way galaxy there were other things. They thought when they saw a galaxy like this other one here, that it's just a nebula. It's a, neb it's a piece of the Milky Way. It's not distant. What Hubble did was he looked at some stars in this Andromeda Nebula and he discovered there were, there were twins of some stars which were in the Milky Way. But because they were so much more fainter than the Milky Way cousins, he knew this thing had to be a long, long, long way away. And so he discovered all of a sudden, well, hang on a second, the Milky Way isn't the end of the universe. There are other universes, if you like, just like the Milky Way, existing all through the universe. So the universe is full of amazing 
galaxies just like ours. So the universe is really big. Uh, he also discovered when he looked at these galaxies, which are now far away, they were actually moving, and they were moving apparently mostly away from us. And so whether they knew something we didn't know, I don't know, but they were all moving away from us. Okay? The universe, in some sense, was expanding. The universe was in motion. It wasn't, const wasn't static, it was in motion. And so he discovered the universe was big and it was expanding, which is a pretty impressive career result for anybody. He spent his entire career classifying galaxies, all these nebulae, classify them into various kinds of patterns, into elliptical galaxies and spiral galaxies and barred galaxies. So he set the stage for the study of galaxies in the universe. He also saw some galaxies which were a bit weird, like this one here. It didn't seem to be a nice sort of pattern. If you look in the bottom right-hand corner, you'll see a little movie of what happens when two galaxies come close to one another. When two galaxies come close to one another, they pull on each other gravitationally. They actually stretch and pull each other like with tides, just like the Earth and the Moon. Galaxies have tides on one another and that tidal interaction can distort the galaxy. And so you see the little animation now starts to look very much like this real thing on the sky. So in fact, we're seeing not only stars change and planets change, but whole galaxies can change during the course of their life. They can be distorted and crunched by galaxies colliding and galaxies even merging together and forming whole new galaxies. So the galaxy subject was incredibly dynamic, so we studied galaxies very intensively. And here's a map of all the galaxies we've found. You see, we started at the Milky Way in the middle and we're pulling away from the Milky Way, going out and out and out into space. And these are real galaxies. These are the positions we've actually found them. And we're seeing, if you like, the cosmic pattern. These are all the galaxies on the sky. And there are hundreds of thousands of millions of galaxies on the sky. We've found lots and lots and lots of galaxies. The interesting thing is that the galaxies are not distributed at random. This is not a universe just sprinkled like you threw a handful of sand on the ground. The universe has some texture and some structure. It looks for all the world a bit like spiderweb or sponge or whatever you want to call it. You can start to see the pattern emerge now. This is not a uniform system. Where did this structure come from? Where did the universe get this? The reason why it looks like butterflies is because we're just looking in particular directions. But in those directions we're looking, you can see how beautifully textured and like fine lace and structured the universe is. That came from the formation of the universe itself. We don't know yet how to fully understand that structure. <coughs> as well as probing the universe, telescopes also are time machines. They let us see how things change with time. Now I want to try to explain this principle because it's very important for astronomy. This young lady is sitting on the ground. She's sitting in a box and the box is one metre by one metre. And so if I took a picture, took this picture of her, the light from, say, the tip of her nose travelled one metre and got into my camera. Light moves very fast, okay? And it took about 100,000 millionth of a, pardon me, 100 millionth of a second to get into my camera. So her nose, I'm seeing the tip of her nose 100 millionth of a second ago. So you can imagine what happens. As I get further and further away, the light, which is staying the same speed, is taking longer to get into my camera. 10 metres away, it took 10 millionth of a second. One kilometre away, a millionth of a second. And so the story goes. The further I go away from her, the longer the light takes to reach my camera, and the older the picture is, essentially, of her when it gets to me. Okay? So by the time I get out beyond the edge of the solar system, it took 10 whole days for that light to get to me from her. So I'm seeing a picture as she looked 10 days in the past. So I can continue and go past the solar system, out into the edges of the Milky Way galaxy, and even out beyond the Milky Way galaxy itself. And so the further away something is, the longer the light takes to get to me, and the further back in time I see the thing happening. So that means the universe is kind of like a video, a DVD. Okay? If I can manage to look really far away, I'm looking really far back in time. And so if I collect the data from a long way away and from intermediate distances and from the present right next to us, I've got the DVD of the universe to play, which is fantastic. It's a great, wonderful tool for astronomers to have. So, I've used, so we've used this kind of cosmic DVD story to actually put down the whole history of the universe. So here in one slide is the entire history of the universe. From the very top, the Big Bang, 13.7 billion years ago, to the bottom, Today, where you see the stars and galaxies around us, right? So we can go backwards in time, we can go out towards the Big Bang simply by looking further and further and further away. So this, in fact, we can see some information coming from this time of the Big Bang itself. There are some radio waves called the cosmic 
microwave background, which have moved, which have arrived at the Earth, having traveled from the time of the Big Bang itself. So we've got a snapshot, if you like, of the Big Bang, when the universe was very hot, expanding rapidly as a plasma of gas and particles. As we come forward and the universe starts to cool, the gas stops glowing and the radiation stops. So we've got a time in the history of the universe here before the stars are formed, when the universe is too cool to glow in the radio, called the Dark Ages. And that's kind of the time before the beginning of everything, right? That's really kind of the great unknown, okay? What's in there? We don't know because nothing's glowing, okay? So it's the beginning of the cosmic story. It's chapter one of the cosmic DVD. And we'd love to be able to get back there. In particular, we'd love to be able to get to the very beginning of the next chapter, which is first light. When the very first objects began to shine in the universe and glow, the universe became bright again. That's called first light. And then from that point forward, all the other objects begin to form and we get to where we are today in the history of the universe. So that first light in the end of the Dark Ages is a great holy grail because that would be the beginning, the first chapter of the cosmic story of creation. So it's this journey to first light which is the next big step for astronomy. This is where we want to go in the future. We've been from Galileo into the local universe. We've been from Hubble into the, early, into the history of the cosmos. We're now perched on the brink of discovering first light. There's one other important thing you need to understand to get on the journey and to get all the way to the first light, and it has to do with something which you're all familiar with called the Doppler effect. So here's a, a pond, and in the pond I'm dipping my finger just up and down, up and down, up and down. I'm making little ripples, little waves on the pond. There's nothing terribly exciting about that. What would happen if I moved my finger across the pond as I did the dipping? What you would see is that the waves wouldn't spread out in nice circles anymore. The waves would be crunched up in advance of my finger and spread out as behind my finger. That's bunching up and spreading out of waves by a moving source. It's called the Doppler effect. You've seen it. You've all heard it. It's a screaming ambulance coming along with a siren blaring. It gets to you and goes past you. The tone of the siren drops. The waves get more spread out. That's the Doppler effect. We can use this to our great advantage in astronomy. Here's a galaxy. Um, here's the radio picture of the galaxy. It emits radio waves. Here's one particular radio wave that it loves to emit called the 21 centimeter radiation. This comes from hydrogen gas. This is a particular kind of radio signal. It has a frequency of around about the same frequency as a mobile phone. It's about 1,420 megahertz. If this galaxy were to be moving away from me, like Hubble told us it was, the waves that would get to me would be all spread apart, just like the backside, but the downside of those waves in the picture there. So the wavelength would drop, the wavelength would get longer, the frequency would drop, and the waves would get stretched in some sense. And so if this is traveling very fast, you can imagine maybe those waves are stretched almost by a factor of 10. Instead of being 1,420 megahertz, you come a one-tenth of that, 140 megahertz. So the faster something is moving away from me, the lower the frequency of the radiation. So if I, I can measure the frequency of the radiation, I can tell you how fast it is moving away. And Mr. Hubble told me on his plot, if it's moving away with a certain velocity, it's this far away. So all of a sudden, I've got a way of measuring the distances to galaxies. By measuring the frequency of the hydrogen, hydrogen radiation, it'll tell me how fast the galaxy is moving. And then Mr. Hubble has told me, if you know how fast it's moving, I can tell you how far away it is. Because there's this relationship between distance and speed. So we've got all the tools we need now. We can measure how far away something is. And once we know how far away it is, we know how long light took to get to us. And so we know how far back into the past that picture is. So now I can build my cosmic DVD story. Okay? So here is the universe again, all spread out for you. Big bang on the left, evolving over to the right to the present day. That arrow now measures distance. Right? So distance zero is right next to me. Distance one is as far as my telescopes can currently see. And distance 10 is the distance to first light. Distance 10 is the distance to the end of the dark ages in the history of the universe. We've got telescopes in Australia like Parkes. It's a big eyeball. It's a radio eyeball. It's about 1,000 square metres of eyeball, very big. And it's a fabulous telescope for looking at the nearby galaxies. It does a really great job. The biggest radio telescopes we have in the world are about 10 times bigger. Not one dish, but 26, 27 dishes all working together, collecting information, 10 times the collecting area of parks. And that gets us to about distance one on this ladder. 
That's about as far as we can see. So you can see we've got a long way to go. We would like to get to 10 on this particular chart. So this is where your maths comes back in, okay? Unfortunately, if you want to get to something which is 10 times further away, you need a 100 times bigger telescope, okay? Because it goes like the area. You have to collect, be more sensitive. That goes like the area. So 10 times further away needs a 100 times bigger telescope. 100 times 10,000 is 1 million. If we want to build a telescope to get us out on this cosmic journey to first light, we have to build 1 million square meters of collecting area, which is one square kilometer, okay? Hence the square kilometer array. This is an incredible step in our ability to do science. So here, over the last four or five hundred years, are all the telescopes we've ever built. All the optical telescopes and the radio telescopes. And on the left-hand side here is a measure of how much better a telescope is to the one that's just succeeded, okay? So every time you build a new telescope, it's better than the one you just had before, we hope so. And so in the fact, it actually turns out to be between, between five and 10. Sometimes in the past we've had some pretty big successes, maybe 100 times better, but between five and 10 times better is our track record for the last two or 300 years. The SKA on this chart is 10,000. Okay. So this, you can imagine what this means for science. And all of a sudden, just imagine having, you know, if you've been, imagine all the things science has done for the last 400 years, all the discovery, and this has all been done with improvements of five and 10 in our ability. If I give you a machine now, which is 10,000 times better than anything you've ever had, imagine what that means to the science. So we're gonna build this thing called the Square Kilometer Array. It's not, this is a terrible name, right? It's not square, it's not a kilometer by kilometer. You know, it happens to be an array, that's about the only good thing for the name. It's telescopes, it's dishes, all working together, combining those dishes area gives you a square kilometer, a million square meters. There's about 3,000 individual dishes. Each one is about 15 meters across. This is a visual impression of what that would look like. Pretty impressive. This is a region of about five kilometers by five kilometers in which about half of those dishes would be positioned. There's different kinds of dishes. Dishes is just one kind of receiver. There are stationary things which are called antennae or aperture arrays. They also receive information. This is spread out, not in the core, but through 3,000 kilometers. So here we're heading out from the core, hundreds of kilometers out from the core, little stations of dishes and receivers. And this goes out for 3,000 kilometers. So a single scientific machine, 3,000 kilometers across, designed to look at the edge of the universe. Who's crazy enough to try to build this, right? I mean, this is not simple. Uh, right now, there are 20 countries who are interested in building this telescope. They've been thinking about it for the last almost 10, maybe almost 15 years. Total capital cost, we're talking about $3 billion just to construct this machine. Where are you going to put it? Now, remember I talked in the beginning of the talk about how important it was to have special places. Special machines are always in special places. Where is the best place in the world to put this telescope? Clearly you want to put it away from radio interference, and radio interference mostly comes from people and things, so isolation is important. You want to have thousands of kilometers of flat space to put it. You want something, you don't want it to be washed away or fall down some earthquake hole. You want dry and stable conditions. You want a good place to look at the sky. You want good people to be able to build it and run it. So all these parameters come into place, and over the last five, six years, We've looked at four particular places in the world where most of these parameters come into play. Argentina, South Africa, Western Australia, and China. In 2005, we chose to look further at Southern Africa and Australia. As you can see in Southern Africa, it's not just one country, it's about eight countries. To get the 3,000 kilometers, you have to gang together a bunch of countries. We are fortunate enough to live in a country which is exactly 3,000 kilometers across, fortunately. So, you know, we're going to a very, very good position to build this amazing machine uh, in Australia. We are actively engaged in a competition now with Southern Africa to produce a bid, if you like, to place this, place this facility uh, in Australia. We will have a result, we'll have a decision in around 2012, and I'll come back and talk about that in a second. Let me just introduce the Murchison Radio Astronomy Observatory. This is the, the heartland, the core of the site in Western Australia, a beautiful part of the Australian bush. Um, big open spaces, lots of uh, flies and, uh, and goannas and uh, kangaroos. 
Um, the Shire of Murchison there, which is the Shire that contains the core site, is the same size as the Netherlands. Its total population is no more than 120 people. Okay. So its population density is two, two milli people per square kilometre. Um, it's about one big toe per square kilometre. Just to give you some idea, here's the population density of the Netherlands. It's about three or 400 people per square kilometre. So we're a factor of a million less dense than the Netherlands and a factor of 10 less dense than the most leastly populated Greenland, which happens to have the lowest population density in the world. So an incredibly isolated place. Because of the isolation, it's very, very quiet. So these, spect these are radio spectra. On the top is the spectrum for Sydney, so power versus frequency. And you can see there's lots of signals. As you'd expect, in any big city, you've got mobile phones and FM, TV st FM stations, TV stations. Down the bottom is the radio spectrum from this place in Western Australia. The only real signals there are coming from things in the sky. So the signals in the land are incredibly small. This is another high resolution picture of the spectrum. And again, there's basically nothing there. There are no signals coming from mankind on the ground. So this is a beautiful place to look at the spectrum. In Australia, we're building on that site now the Australian SKA Pathfinder. So this is a little array, 36 dishes, not 3,000, about 1% the size of the SKA, and it's a new technology telescope for Australia, $150 million worth of investment from Australian government in astronomy. This is being built. It'll be finished in about a year and a half time from now. So we're building a Pathfinder to appreciate the site, to test the site, and to test some of the technologies. We've connected this telescope to other telescopes in Australia, all the way across even to New Zealand, using communications channels we have today. So we're already starting to use this facility in some sense. And we've combined all those telescopes together and produced a picture of a radio galaxy, a very high resolution picture of a radio galaxy, which wasn't possible before. So some of the technologies for the SKA we're already working on. The NBN, I have to say, is an incredibly important thing for the SKA. It's going to provide the fiber optic backbone to transmit the enormous amounts of data that the SKA is going to produce. I'll come back to the SKA as, a, as an ICT project in a minute, but it is going to not only drive science this century, but communications and information technology. The SKA will have more data flowing in it in 2020 than the entire internet in 2020. Just one telescope, right? So it is incredibly important project for ICT and the fiber optic connectivity of the NBN will be important for this project to work. There are new things happening like the new International Center for Radio Astronomy Research in Perth that I happen to be the director of. Again, $100 million worth of investment from the West Australian Government and the University of Western Australia and Curtin University. $150 million into the ASCAP Pathfinder. $80 million into a new supercomputer center from the federal government. So in the last two years, the federal and state governments have invested something of the order of $350 million into the preparation of the Australian systems for the SKA. We are very serious about this, and I've never seen, speaking as a scientist, the collaboration between scientific and governmental and community bodies at state and federal level across both sides of the house. This is a project which is capturing the imagination of Australia. So that's what I'd like the West Australian desert to look like in about 2025, um, the source, the home of the SKA. The Square Kilometre Array will be the largest international astronomical facility of the 21st century. If it's built in Australia, it'll be the largest single endeavour in Australia's scientific history. And it will occupy the central position of our technology, our scientific and our educational interests for the next 50 years. Every single day, this telescope will generate one billion billion bytes of information, one exabyte. That's equivalent to the data production of the entire world in a year. Every year, the planet produces an exabyte. Every day, the SKA will produce an exabyte. The world's biggest data system, the world's biggest computer, the world's biggest data network will be in Australia because of this project. The Large Hadron Collider in, in Geneva, a big science project, what did it do? The technology of the Large Hadron Collider invented the web. That was one of the things it did for society, it invented the web. You can imagine a facility of this scale and this proportion, what it will do for the world, not just in astronomy, but in information technology and innovation. And it will be here in our own country. It'll be here in our back garden, as the, as the movie has said. It's a very exciting time to be an astronomer in Australia. 
this is your project. This is Australia's project and New Zealand's project. It's for your kids. It's not, you know, this is, we're talking 15 years down the road. Uh, I'm going to be growing grapes in the Swan Valley probably, but the kids that I teach will be using this facility to do great science. This is going to be a century level project for our future of our community and our kids. Your taxpayers' dollars are going to help pay for this. But it's a global project. It's not just about Australia and New Zealand. This is something for the world, and Australia is trying very, very hard to provide the world with this amazing step forward in science. Thank you.